Hello everyone. So as I said, I'm going to read a little bit from this collection of writings. These uh, are selected because they, are, they all have to do with the theme of desire and the selections are all from the writings of Haruki Murakami. The part I'm going to read is the second in this selection and it is titled On Seeing the 100% Perfect Girl One Beautiful April Morning. So let's begin. One beautiful April morning on a narrow side street in Tokyo's fashionable Harajuku neighborhood, I walk past the 100% perfect girl. Tell you the truth, she's not that good looking. She doesn't stand out in any way. Her clothes are nothing special. The back of her hair is still bent out of shape from sleep. She isn't young either, must be near 30. Not even close to a girl, properly speaking. But still, I know from 50 yards away, she is the 100% perfect girl for me. The moment I see her, there's a rumbling in my chest and my mouth is as dry as a desert. Maybe you have your own particular favorite type of girl. One with slim ankles, say, or big eyes or graceful fingers, or you're drawn for no good reason to girls who take their time with every meal. I have my own preferences, of course. Sometimes in a restaurant, I'll catch myself staring at the girl at the table next to mine because I like the shape of her nose. But no one can insist that his 100% perfect girl correspond to some preconceived type. Much as I like noses, I can't recall the shape of hers, or even if she had one. All I can remember for sure is that she was no great beauty. It's weird. Yesterday on the street, I passed the 100% perfect girl, I tell someone. Yeah, he says. Good looking? Not really. Your favorite type then? I don't know. I can't seem to remember anything about her. The shape of her eyes or the size of her breasts. Strange. Yeah, strange. So anyhow, he says, already bored, what did you do? Talk to her? Follow her? Nah, just passed her on the street. She's walking east to west and I west to east. It's a really nice April morning. Wish I could talk to her. Half an hour would be plenty. Just ask her about herself, tell her about myself and what I'd really like to do, explain to her the complexities of fate that have led to our passing each other on a side street in Harajuku on a beautiful April morning in 1981. This was something sure to be crammed full of warm secrets, like an antique clock built when peace filled the world. After talking, we'd have lunch somewhere, maybe see a Woody Allen movie, stop by a hotel bar for cocktails. With any kind of luck, we might end up in bed. Potentiality knocks on the door of my heart. Now, the distance between us has narrowed to 15 yards. How can I approach her? What should I say? Good morning, miss. Do you think you could spare half an hour for a little conversation? Ridiculous. I'd sound like an insurance salesman. Pardon me, but would you happen to know if there is an all-night cleaners in the neighborhood? No, this is just as ridiculous. I'm not carrying any laundry, for one thing. Who's going to buy a line like that? Maybe the simple truth would do. Good morning. You are the 100% perfect girl for me. No, she wouldn't believe it. Or even if she did, she might not want to talk to me. Sorry, she could say, I might be the 100% perfect girl for you, but you are not the 100% perfect boy for me. It could happen. And if I found myself in that situation, I'd probably go to pieces. I'd never recover from the shock. I'm 32, and that's what growing older is all about. We pass in front of a flower shop. A small, warm air mass touches my skin. The asphalt is damp, and I catch the scent of roses. I can't bring myself to speak to her. She wears a white sweater, and in her right hand, she holds a crisp white envelope, lacking only a stamp. So, she's written somebody a letter, maybe spend the whole night writing, to judge from the sleepy look in her eyes. The envelope could contain every secret she's ever had. I take a few more strides and turn. She is lost in the crowd. Now, of course, I know exactly what I should have said to her. It would have been a long speech though, far too long for me to have delivered it properly. The ideas I come up with are never very practical. Oh well, it would have started once upon a time and ended a sad story, don't you think? Once upon a time, there lived a boy and a girl. The boy was 18 and the girl 16. He was not unusually handsome, and she was not especially beautiful. They were just an ordinary lonely boy and an ordinary lonely girl, like all the others. But they believed with their whole hearts that somewhere in the world, 
there lived the 100% perfect boy and the 100% perfect girl for them. Yes, they believed in a miracle. And that miracle actually happened. One day, the two came upon each other on the corner of a street. This is amazing, he said. I've been looking for you all my life. You may not believe this, but you are the 100% perfect girl for me. And you, she said to him, are the 100% perfect boy for me, exactly as I had pictured you in every detail. It's like a dream. They sat on a park bench, held hands, and told each other their stories hour after hour. They were not lonely anymore. They had found and been found by their 100% perfect other. What a wonderful thing it is to find and be found by your 100% perfect other. It's a miracle, a cosmic miracle. As they sat and talked, however, a tiny, tiny silver of doubt took root in their hearts. Was it really all right for one's dreams to come true so easily? And so, when there came a momentary lull in their conversation, the boy said to the girl, let's test ourselves just once. If you really are each other's 100% perfect lovers, then sometime, somewhere, we will meet again without fail. And when that happens, and we know that we are the 100% perfect ones, we'll marry then and there. What do you think? Yes, she said. That is exactly what we should do. And so they parted, she to the east and he to the west. The test they had agreed upon, however, was utterly unnecessary. They should never have undertaken it, because they really and truly were each other's 100% perfect lovers, and it was a miracle that they had ever met. But it was impossible for them to know this, young as they were. The cold, indifferent waves of fate proceeded to toss them unmercifully. One winter, both the boy and the girl came down with the season's terrible influenza. And after drifting for weeks between life and death, they lost all memory of their earlier years. When they awoke, their heads were as empty as the young D.H. Lawrence's piggy bank. They were two bright, determined young people, however, and through their unremitting efforts, they were able to acquire once again the knowledge and feeling that qualified them to return as full-fledged members of society. Heaven be praised. They became truly upstanding citizens who knew how to transfer from one subway line to another, <laughs> who were fully capable of sending a special delivery letter at the post office. Indeed, they even experienced love again sometimes as much as 75% or even 85% love. Time passed with shocking swiftness, and soon the boy was 32, the girl 30. One beautiful April morning, in search of a cup of coffee to start the day, the boy was walking from west to east, while the girl intending to send the special delivery letter was walking from east to west, both along the same narrow street in the Harajuku neighborhood of Tokyo. They passed each other in the very center of the street. The faintest gleam of their lost memories glimmered for the briefest moment in their hearts. Each felt a rumbling in the chest and they knew, she is the 100% perfect girl for me, he is the 100% perfect boy for me. But the glow of their memories was far too weak and their thoughts no longer had the clarity of 14 years earlier. Without a word, they passed each other, disappearing into the crowd forever. A sad story, don't you think? Yes, that's it. That is what I should have said to her. One way to interpret this uh, little short story or a fragment of a short story is to think of it as the goal of the boy being the attainment of the story itself. The boy, what the boy desired, what did he really want? What did he truly want? Not by paying attention to, we are answering this question, not by paying attention to what he said to us or what we are reading, but by what he did. We are paying attention to his actions. And his actions go from observations of the scenario to adopting a position, arriving at a position where he can tell that sad story. And he tells in retrospect that I should have said that sad story to the girl. But if he had told her that sad story, then that sad story would have evaporated. This is the kind of story that, by telling it, you're actually destroying it. You destroy the possibility, the conditions within which the story is, um, the story is told or the story exists or subsists. 
So maybe the aim of the boy is the ability to have that story, the ability to tell that story. Maybe that is the aim. And to achieve that aim, to, to be able to embody that scenario, he must pass by the girl, his so-called 100% perfect girl, and not talk to her because it is by not talking to her that he can arrive at, he can achieve that sad story. It is only by not talking to her that he can achieve the scenario of a sad love story. And this, uh, this interpretation is something that we can think about in light of Sergio Salvatore's discussion of the cultural psychology of desire. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will speak with you in the next video.